Thank you for listening to SPN, the Savage Podcasting Network. You're listening to The Stephen Savage Show on the Savage Podcasting Network. And now here's your host, film and television director, Stephen Savage. Thank you, Andrea. How's it going, everyone? Savage here with you for yet another episode of The Stephen Savage Show, the official podcast of the Idlewild International Festival of Cinema, touted by The Hollywood Reporter as the greatest little film festival on earth, podcasting as usual from Cranium Wheel Studios at Chateau Esteban in the picturesque alpine village of Idlewild, California, only a couple hours east of Los Angeles, but a world away at nearly 6,000 feet, high atop beautiful Mount San Jacinto and overlooking the great Coachella Valley. But, um, Before I bring on my special guest for this episode, I want to take time to mention some of our local Idlewild sponsors of the Idlewild Cinema Festival. Uh, Coming up very quickly now uh, from the time of our recording this, uh, March 5th through the 10th in downtown Idlewild, California. Hosted, as always, by our forever home, the Rustic Theater and Entertainment Center, as well as the all-new Talk Eats Pines Retreat, a large, beautiful lodging and gathering space nestled in the pines here in Idlewild. You owe it to yourself before coming to the Idlewild Festival, or any time of the year for that matter, to check out the gorgeous facilities at TalkEatsPines.com. That's T-A-H-Q-U-I-T-Z. TalkEatsPines.com And while you're at it, visit the website of the Idlewild Inn, a very cool lodging sponsor of the festival at IdlewildInn.com And a brand new and very special sponsor of ours, the Harvey House, a beautiful and welcoming wedding venue situated right on Strawberry Creek, just a short walk over the bridge to downtown Idlewild. If you're looking for the perfect place to hold your wedding, log on to HarveyHouseID.com And one of our longtime sponsors, Woodland Park Manor, uh, peacefully tucked away in the forest, just a short walk as well from downtown Idlewild at woodlandparkmanor.com. Check them out. And two more very special sponsors who've been on hand for every single Idlewild Cinema Fest since day one, the very charming Bluebird Cottage Inn. And you can check them out if you're looking for a great place to stay while at the festival at bluebirdcottageinn.com. And last but certainly not least, one of my favorite local Idlewild shops right next door to the Rustic Theater, it's Woolies, your one-stop shop for all your cold weather clothing needs, outfitting Idlewild Cinema Fest attendees since the festival first got underway 15 years ago. And you can visit this awesome little shop at woolies.com. Okay, so with that little bit of grateful housekeeping accomplished let me bring on my guest for today's podcast uh she's a film and television director as well as a legendary script supervisor whose body of work includes such iconic blockbuster films as uh, oh rob reiner's stand by me uh ghost with patrick swayze and demi moore um, clear and present danger in which she uh, worked with harrison ford as well as uh idlewild cinema fest grand jury member ann archer um, she worked on also The Man in the High Castle, a great show. Um, it, the list just goes on and on of the film and TV productions this amazing woman's been involved with. And most recently, she's been working as a director and script supervisor on the epic ABC cop series The Rookie. But perhaps the biggest feather in our caps here at the Idlewild International Festival of Cinema is the fact that she's the newest member of our grand jury. And we're honored and completely stoked to announce that she and I will be working together on my upcoming feature film, which I'll be announcing uh, very soon. Um, She'll be handing out the uh, Best Director Awards as well at the ID Awards ceremony on the last day of the Idlewild Cinema Festival. That's March 10th at the Rustic Theater. So, without further ado, let me welcome in, calling from her home in Los Angeles, my friend, Faye Brenner. Faye, how are you? I'm fine. Wow, what an introduction. (laughs) Gosh. (laughs) You finally get a chance to speak. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Thank you, Stephen. That was lovely. (laughs) Oh, well, just just the facts, young lady, just the facts. Um, (laughs) 
you know, it's been it it hasn't been that long since you and I got together um, in Hollywood. Now, just outside uh, Paramount Studios, pretty recently, it was right right in the middle of the SAG after strike and the WGA strike. So neither of us were were inside the studio that day, not wanting to cross the picket lines. But we did have a nice uh, lunch and talk shop, etc. And and just before that, we met up right outside the studio as well on a day. I was giving a friend of mine a private tour of the studio of Paramount, and we got together at, uh, I think it was Lemonade on Larchmont, a place I've been to a, yeah. few, a few times since you introduced me to it, um, near the Melrose Gate, if I recall. But I'm excited mm-hmm. now that I'll get to see you and hang out a bit during the film festival next month. Yeah, I'm excited too. I, you know, it uh, it was certainly a wonderful memory for me last year, and my film walked away with awards, and mm-hmm. and uh, it was very exciting, and it was fun to be with all those people and all those young filmmakers, and um, uh, and see how much talent there is out there, uh, and to you know be part of the group and uh, uh, encouraging, very supportive, very very supportive group from from you guys at the festival and just generally, you know, all the all the filmmakers there to support each other. It's, it's really lovely. Yeah, it's a finally a chance for people who, well, like yourself, um, you know, who work on the higher end of film production to actually get to meet a lot of up and coming new talent. And it, that's that's um, always that's my the fun part for me is just getting to meet people from all over the world who are just starting to spread their wings in the film uh, industry through independent film. And then we have you, you mentioned the uh, ID Awards. I'll be hosting the awards with a couple friends of mine this year, Samantha Lockwood, who my listeners will know from Hawaii 5 and a film she starred in, which just left theaters, I believe, uh, called God is a Bullet, and also mm-hmm. my friend Emily Peachy, who starred in the uh, really wonderful film The Fault in Our Stars, and most recently she did a turn on a show in which she starred opposite Jeff Daniels uh, called American Rust. So... Um, setting aside the fact that I'm going to be on stage, there's actually a great lineup of people hosting, <laughs> including you. So I'm very excited about that, that you'll be handing out some uh, of the best director awards in the uh, short film, featurette, and feature film categories. Yeah, the pressure is on now. <laughs> <laughs> it's uh it's always it's always nice to uh you know just see the the awards and and I told a friend of mine who's a very well-known actor and he came up one year and he said man these these filmmakers are so excited and I go yeah to them this is the Oscars this is you know they're, they've been working hard to get a film done just to be here and so i i honor them and i appreciate the uh the effort and um i take it very seriously and when i in a few times in the past industry people who've come up and kind of made light of it oh big deal and i'm like you know that's not that's not the attitude this is an important day that the awards for these filmmakers and i really enjoy it, the process it is a big deal it's it's a big deal to everybody you know to to put together a uh, a film, even in spite of all my years in the industry, to to finally put something together of my own, mm-hmm. and it took a lot of hours and a lot of help from a lot of people. And um, you know, without that help, it wouldn't have happened. Um, uh, and it's it's difficult. It's not an easy thing. And so, getting recognized, even in in a place like Idlewild, um, as opposed to New York, it doesn't matter. Mm-hmm. Just the fact that that. Um, the the work is recognized as you know is what it's all about um mm-hmm. and that's really great and that's the wonderful thing about the festival yeah i've i've heard people say before you know are film festivals really worth it are they even important and it's to me it's like it's very important it's a it's some for a lot of people it's only their first time you know having a voice with their work and um and to me, it's like just from the basics, you know, try renting a theater and then getting your friends to come and buy tickets <laughs> and then at, the, <laughs> right. at a film festival. You actually get uh, you get recognized in a big way and uh, and you've got a built in audience. And I think film festivals are very, very important. Also, the feedback from other um, filmmakers and, right. and from general audience because otherwise you're just working in a vacuum, mm-hmm. and you know, and I, you know, when I made my film, it, it, I was so happy to be able to have people watch it 
other than me and my editor. <laughs> um, so it, it's like really, really important to be able to have a, a venue. That's to right. To do that. And, yeah. Yeah. And then, you know, I, I learned quickly on when we first started the uh, film festival, I would, you know, get on the phone and beg my well-known actor and director friends to come up. And then I realized that's not necessarily why the filmmakers are coming up there. It's not really about what movie star they can, you know, that's fun. But the thing is, it's uh, it's more about being heard you know being seen just being showcased and also you know we bring uh distribution people up so it's a chance to um you know talk about your film to somebody who can actually get it out there in in an even bigger way which is which is exciting Mm -hmm. yes absolutely so if you don't mind i like to start my interviews off by allowing my listeners a chance to know a bit about my guests how they got started in the biz the the early forays into the entertainment business, where they grew <laughs> up, etc. So, to continue in that tradition, give, uh, give us um, the Reader's Digest condensed version of your journey, culmin- <laughs> culminating in your working on some of the biggest Hollywood films of the past couple decades. Well, I um, kind of cheated in that um, I grew up around the industry because my father was a production designer. Mm-hmm. So uh, films were always uh, in the cards for me, and music, because my mother was a pianist. So um, I didn't have much choice. Mm. (laughs) Uh, But I started as an actor, and um, I needed to put braces on my teeth. I needed a job, and I needed to pay for the braces. (laughs) I I was 23, and I had gone out and, and sung with some bands and did a bunch of theater, but... Um, uh, I knew that to do film, I was going to have to make some changes. Sure. And so I sat with my dad and said, okay, what can I do right now in the industry where I can move up to directing if I want to? Mm-hmm. And we narrowed it to editing and script. And because I was an actor, I chose to be on the set with the director and the actors, and so I chose script. Um, uh, to those who are thinking about it, I would suggest editing <laughs> because it's a faster route <laughs> and you have more more creative input as mm-hmm. an editor mm-hmm. than you do as a script supervisor. But I, I, I wouldn't trade it. I worked with some amazing people um, and, you know, that was my film school mm-hmm. because I didn't go to film school. And I started in television when there were no female directors in television mm-hmm. and I was in my, my mid-20s. And then finally, the the um, I decided that since I was bumping my head on the television ceiling, I'd better do something else. And uh, I decided to do features. I wanted to work with the best of the best. Mm-hmm. And I got lucky. Um, the company gave me my first feature, and my second feature was Stand By Me. Mm-hmm. And I learned so much from Rob, and it was his second feature. And then from there, I jumped on to other things. I did... The morning after with Sidney Lumet, that was film school, right? Right there, yeah. Uh, and uh, and you know, Clear and Present Danger with Harrison and and Philip Noyce directing. Philip had been an editor and uh, and then became a director. So again, more to learn. Um, the Ghost with Jerry Zucker direct, directing and Patrick Swayze and Demi, that uh, and Whoopi. Mm-hmm. Whoopi was a riot and uh, kept us laughing all day long. <laughs> um, so that was my film school. And then when I finally decided I would go back to script, it was because I got married and started having kids, and I didn't want to leave town. Mm-hmm. So I went back into television, uh, and I got on a couple of series. And th- at that time, it was that's a good way for a script supervisor to move up. Sure was to get onto a show, convince them that you're capable, <laughs> and be given an episode. Yeah. And so I did that, um, uh, and I was on a show. I was supposed to move up. I'd been on the show for five years, and I was next in line, and the show got canceled. Oh. And so there I was having to start from page one all over again. Right. Um, so just kind of did that and jumped from show to show until I got the rookie, and it became clear that um, the showrunner was willing to move me up. Mm -hmm. He took me to the network. The network said, we have no doubt that you can do this, but we need to see something. And so I was forced to make a short film. And and so I did. They loved it. My showrunner loved it. And I got an episode of The Rookie. And um, so now I'm hoping that the next season coming up, I get another episode. (laughs) Uh, I've got another short that I'm working on. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, and then I get to work with you, and I'm very excited about that. Yeah. Uh, that's going to be really fun. It hasn't happened yet, and, so don't uh, get too excited, do we? <laughs> 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 um, but, uh, but, yeah, so uh, I'm just moving forward. That's the, that's the only way. But I will say that, um, you know, anybody who wants to be a director mm-hmm. is nowadays it's making a short film, mm-hmm. you know, or even a feature, but making a film, let people see what you can do. I say um, that uh, and, too. When I've I've taught, I've taught at AFI. You know, I've taught first year directors, and I've um, lectured at here in Idaho. There's the Idaho Arts Academy, and, and I've I've lectured out there in the past. And I always tell everybody, make just make a movie. I went to film school, and in high in hindsight, it was a great experience. But I think I would have been in the same trajectory as I am now had I not spent the money on film school. However, having said that, I did make some connections there. My, you know, some of my early um, mentors like, uh, you know, Mike Motor and um, Walter Hill and uh, Alan Levy, I actually met at, at AFI. So I'm glad that I had that experience, but I think you're right. Just go out and make a movie, you know, and um I just love your energy. You're just always all about <laughs> moving forward and just going and doing it, you know? I love just that. Go get out there and do it. Just keep <laughs> just move forward and it doesn't matter how long. It doesn't have to be a long movie. I've I've been to some festivals in this last year mm-hmm. that I saw several that were like six minutes. Mm-hmm. I saw one that was four minutes from Italy. Mm-hmm. It was beautiful. Yeah. Um, so just just go out and do it and uh it's it's the process. It's uh it's Putting it from you know paper onto film and editing it and 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 getting it out there. Um, uh, get your family involved. <laughs> <laughs> and and beg All your, your friends. friends. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> but, that's right. <laughs> yeah, it is. It's filmmaking is one of those uh, where you know one of those sort of ventures where you can actually say it's not the destination, it's the journey, because the journey uh, of becoming a a filmmaker is is all about just getting it done just starting it and then putting your head down like a little bull and making things happen you know and i i find that's the best advice i have ever given people is just that you know just go do it and it sounds simple but it's true and and in your case yeah. <laughs> in your case it, you know you you uh work on these huge big budget films and then you're willing to say yeah but it's not it's not enough i want to i want to direct and and i'm going to start off even if it's with a small little short film and that's what that's what's great about short films they're like film school you know 3 4 days on a set of a short film is like 3 years of film school i think <laughs> oh, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. The the whole the coordination, your casting, learning how to cast. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, you know, that's a big deal. Casting. It, <laughs> it took me a long time to find my cast, mm-hmm. and I wasn't going to settle. I needed really good people, or mm-hmm. I wasn't going to make the movie. Mm-hmm. And uh, because being as far along as I am in the business, for me to come out with something just sort of average, I wasn't willing to do that. Mm-hmm. And, um, uh, and, you know, hyping myself to all these big wigs I know, right. uh, I had to put something together that was good. So mm-hmm. ca- I learned a lot about casting mm-hmm. and, um, and then trusting my, my DP, yeah. being able to, to have discussion with my DP and know that he saw what I saw. Mm-hmm. And, and that's really evident in my film. Mm-hmm. Um, and I was very specific since it was a period thing taking place in the late 70s. I wanted a particular look. I didn't want it to be Kodachrome colors and, and you know, splashy modern mm-hmm. TV kind of look. Mm-hmm. And um, he understood that because of the nature of the story, because it's all about the story. Mm-hmm. It's tell the story. And, um, and you can tell a story very simply with two people at a table, mm-hmm. or you can, you know, do it with people riding bicycles, but it, it's, it's the story. Mm-hmm. And oh, that's one thing I learned from Rob Reiner on Stand By Me. He and his DP got into arguments a lot because the DP wanted to make beautiful pictures, mm-hmm. um, as he would, and Rob was all about telling the story. And so sometimes the camera would get in the way. Mm-hmm. Uh, of telling what the story that he wanted to tell, and that's really true. You don't have to do a lot of uh, uh, amazing 
cinema t- cinematography unless that's part of the story mm-hmm. um, you know to for especially for a short film um, you want to get the emotion out you want to get the characters across to the audience and have them feel something sure and that's the it's funny you talk about Rob Reiner, and I've, I've known so many people that have worked with him, and one of the actors who I've worked on, I've directed on three different projects, and he was in um, another uh, Reiner film, um, A Few Good Men, uh, Wolfgang Bodison, who played Lance Corporal mm-hmm. Dawson, and he started off as, as Reiner's uh, personal assistant, and then just they just threw him into the role and then expanded it, and uh, he said the same thing. He goes, working with Rob is like, you you just watch the guy, and you know, there's, people talk about Spielberg, and they talk about you know, other big directors, but he said it's like, Rob's kind of under the radar, but he just, the way he works is brilliant, and uh, yeah, mm-hmm. Everybody talks about him like if with with Reiner, it's all about just just tell the people a good story and don't worry about being so fancy about it, you know. And I think that that's works right. right. Yeah, um, yeah. You, you talked about the road to directing and editing being one one really major one, of course. But script supervising, do you do you find that that would be a good place if someone were starting out and they want to be a director, but they know they kind of have to start out a little lower. Would you say script supervising? Because it's such a close camera job. You know, you're right there and you're working with, you know, these big name actors and everything. And it's um, getting that first directing job is hard anyway. But that seems like script supervising might be a good way for wannabe directors to start off. Would you uh, recommend that to um, people who? Are... I would say that I would say that if your if your goal is to direct, mm-hmm. um, script supervising is not a bad way mm-hmm. to to start because you have to. If you don't already know about editing, you will learn it. Mm-hmm. Be, by being a script supervisor, because that's what it's, you know, you you are the liaison between the editor and the set and right. the director. So right. you have to know both minds and, um, and visually, and you have to know screen directions. Mm-hmm. And it's not just about, you know, giving the actors their lines, and it's not just about uh, giving matching notes that they hold the cigarette in the same hand mm-hmm. every time. Mm-hmm. It's, uh, it's a lot more than that. And the the good script supervisors of which I I would like to count myself in that uh, group mm-hmm. are the ones who who are more of a sounding board with the director mm-hmm. uh, about, sometimes about performance sometimes about just the shot um, uh, there have been times <clears throat> earlier in my career where because we you know nowadays in television you're working three cameras all the time but mm-hmm. in those days it was one maybe two cameras and it was film and the sun is going down, and the director still has six shots that they want to get. <laughs> and and you know, the script supervisor, I've done this, walked in and said, "Well, why do you need that? If you do this instead, you'll get it all." Right. And uh, uh, and be able to throw that out. But I'm a loudmouth, so uh, you know, not everybody jumps in like but, that. But directors. But if you're, if you're, Directors appreciate that Yeah, if that you're wanting so to direct, much. you'll be that loudmouth. That's you'll, right. You'll, you'll do that. <laughs> That's right. Um, <laughs> and I, the, I never show screenplays. I never show them to other writers. I always show them to first ADs or I'll show them to script supervisors. And right now, this <laughs> film that we're going to be working on together, you and I, our script supervisor, um, Nicole Jolly, she's young, but she's so savvy and uh, she's she and I because she did the breakdowns. She didn't just do breakdowns. She told me, you know, this doesn't work, and here's why. And ninety nine percent of the the time, she was she's been right so far. Mm-hmm, you know, mm-hmm. um, it's also mm-hmm. you're mentioning, uh, you know, working with cinematographers, working with DPs, and um, I work primarily. I try to work as much with the same team over and over again. And sometimes mm-hmm. you have to rebuild. After COVID, I've really had to rebuild my team because it's just people scattered, you know. So, but mm-hmm. I'm grateful that I have um, Tarina Vandendries to uh, mm-hmm. work with again. But she's that way. She's able to tell me, you know, I we're gonna we're not gonna make our page count if you want those five shots. But let me show you how we can get it. And she oh, she's always right. And um, mm-hmm. so yeah, people don't realize that being a script supervisor is. It is a you can be a sounding board and, and many times a director will so appreciate that it's like damn why didn't I think about that <laughs> mm-hmm. 
<laughs> so and also things things in the background, like for instance. Um, uh, you know, the director is watching the main actor, mm -hmm. and as a script supervisor, I'm looking at everything. Mm -hmm. And you know, directors try to look at everything, but I'm the script supervisor is the extra eyes and ears sure, yeah. for the director. Mm -hmm. And so I'll see something in the background that maybe is terrible, and the operator didn't see it, or it's something that interferes with with the scene, and I'll mention it, and mm -hmm. it can get fixed, mm -hmm. or um, something that should be in the background. That um, that isn't there, mm -hmm. um, uh, so you know stuff like that. It's it's a team sport. Yeah. You know, directing, script supervisor, DP. Also, a good DP is going to really understand the story, mm -hmm. and is and again, you know, it's all about story, mm -hmm. and understand what the director is trying to do in telling that story. So mm -hmm. to make it smooth and fast, and and something that I've learned and now as a director is the prep. Mm -hmm. and the prep with the cameraman. So I didn't say a lot about the type of camera mm -hmm. or, or anything like that on my film, um, and I certainly didn't do that on uh, The Rookie, but to be able to say, okay, this part is all going to be static, mm -hmm. and, um, and then uh, when she walks in the room, then it's going to be all handheld mm -hmm. because I want the energy of the handheld. And the same thing on the rookie. We did the same same kind of thing, and and use the body cameras, change the mm -hmm. change the uh, um, <clears throat> the speed. You know, go to 48 frames and that kind of thing to really uh, get the energy or um, uh, you know change it up. And then in the more dramatic scenes, make it a more static camera and the lighting to be. Uh, to emphasize the emotion that's going on in that scene. Yeah, as um, a as a director, I've never told uh, a DP which lens to swing ever once. Uh, what my uh, my gift and and why I work with Trina so well is she can kind of think ahead. She knows what I'm thinking sometimes a little before I am, you know. So, but <laughs> but the thing is, we have that lingo between each other sometimes it's telepathic and it seems weird but sometimes it's just I can just say this is what I'm looking for like right now we're doing lens testing on some very vintage lenses um lenses from the 70s and 80s um mm. just to get that sort of uh mid 70s Robert Altman sort of you know action flick thing the, the drive-in movies it's just an mm -hmm. I'm fascinated right. by those things I saw them at you know first in the mid to late 70s when I was in grade school and I'm looking at film not knowing why I loved it but now I can actually explain why I liked it and uh yeah it's um I think just building that rapport with um with both the DP and the script supervisor and I've had script supervisors save me in things as weird as like uh, costuming uh yeah that's oh, yeah. she shouldn't be in that costume this is the costume and it's like the costumer you know oh my god she's right and uh and I've had that happen so many times so you have to kind of be the quarterback on the film um as a script supervisor that's for sure yeah, I got into a big heated thing. I, I upset the apple cart once on on uh, without a trace because the uh, the costume designer had come up with a something for this girl to wear, and and I looked at it and said, this woman would never wear this in this neighborhood in the middle of the night, <laughs> yeah. and um, and everybody went round and round, and the director kind of agreed with me, and it ended up with the producer, and you know, half an hour later. Uh, a very pissed off costume designer had to change her outfit. <laughs> right. But but yeah. it was true. It just didn't it didn't make sense. And and that's uh, you know one of my pet peeves is to watch something where something is so absurd. Mm -hmm. And it's just like really. And as a, as uh, a director, you've got to learn, and I've I've learned it. You've got to learn to listen to the people who are outside your peripheral vision. And and you know just recently I had uh, we were talking about the the uh, script supervisor we're working with on this next film of mine and she had a scene that just bothered her so I said what is it and she said you've got the lead female and she's going through all this dramatic stuff and yet she comes on to the male lead and it, it that scene it seems too early and I looked at it, I went damn <laughs> You're absolutely right, <laughs> and uh, yeah. so we uh, right. we we worked the script together, and it, she's just absolutely right. So, 
being a director sometimes is just having the gift to pick the right people. You know, you, you're talking about casting. I had to learn to be a caster, casting director on all my projects because I love casting directors sometimes, but sometimes, I, you know, through just through the, the mere, you know, fact that I had to, out of necessity, I've had to cast some films and then I learned to do it. Then I learned, learned to deal with, um, agents who are, mm -hmm. it's funny, you, you've probably run into this, but it's like, um, you know, the, you, you have an actor friend who you've known a while and they're a well-known actor and you go, Hey, let's do a movie together. Oh, that's great. Let's do it. And so you plan it and you're talking about it. Then you, well, it's time to get a hold of your rep. And then it just goes south <laughs> real quick oh. <laughs> as soon as the agent comes on. <laughs> it's it's a nightmare because it, then it's like, yeah. you know, they're looking out for the interest of their of their actor. And it's like, ah, he, he or she should have never made this friend deal with you. But it's like I've learned to work around it. Now it's just like, you know, he's my friend, but he, I can go find another actor for this. And then everything changes. And, oh, no, 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 we didn't mean that. He wants to do the movie. <laughs> so you just have, you have to. Well, yeah, there's now a, with with casting being being um, you know uh, all uh, you know remote, that where mm -hmm. the the actors turn in uh, you know taped auditions, uh, video yeah. of themselves, you mm -hmm. know, as opposed to being in the room with the actor. Yeah. Right. Which which I like because then I can give a note to the actor and see if they can pull it off. Yep. And um, uh, and it's much more difficult. When you're doing it the other way, then you, mm -hmm. you have to make a phone call. They have to re mm -hmm. reshoot themselves, blah blah blah. Um, fortunately, I didn't have to do too much of that, but but um, but I miss that being in the room. Yeah. Thing. Yeah. Well, I I I don't mind the taped audition thing, but I still I've gone back to live kind of having people come in for just that reason. You can you can tell so much more in a short amount of time than you can looking at tape it out, uh, taped audition after taped audition. Then you have to get on the phone. Can we get together and run this scene again with me doing, you know, and you'll do Zoom auditions. And it's just, I'd rather I have a little office in in L.A. and I'd just rather have people show up there and have somebody read with them and just, you know, it's just better for me. It's old school, but I just like doing it yeah, that I, way. The, the tape thing is good for culling mm -hmm. initially. Yeah. And then after that... After that, to bring people in, yeah. Yeah, and yeah, that's absolutely. another thing about another... having a good team is that, you know, the smaller roles, the smaller supporting roles, I never have to cast those. I just, I know so many actors. I've taught at the, the Screen Actors Guild Conservatory. I, I know so many actors that I go, you know, my buddy so-and-so would be great for this. Or, you know, I know this young mm -hmm. woman who'd be perfect for that. And I just give them the role. I know they'll pull it off. So mm -hmm. there's, mm -hmm. there's, way to cast, there's ways to cast your own movie. Yeah, um, an interesting side note um, about my film. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Nick Gomez plays uh, the male lead mm -hmm. in my film, and I didn't know Nick. Mm -hmm. um, I had heard a friend of a friend of a friend told me, you know, here's this guy, and he works, and maybe he'll do it. Mm -hmm. And uh, and he read the script and said, absolutely, I know this guy, I want to do it. <laughs> and my producer, Makia Cox, and my writer, Dietra Hicks, we we met him on Zoom, and uh, and we all the three of us said the same thing. He's absolutely the guy. We mm -hmm. we have to have him, mm -hmm. and he was great. He's just such a wonderful actor. Well, then cut to me doing my episode on the rookie, and there was a role that hadn't been cast. And I called the casting director. I said, "Do you have somebody in mind?" And she said, "No, do you?" <laughs> and I said, "Well." Um, I'd like to suggest uh, Nick Gomez, and she said, "Oh, I love Nick. He's great." Right. And lo and behold, he got ca he got the part. Mm -hmm. Well, it turned out to be a short thing for him that particular gig, because he had also been cast um, in Fargo, so mm -hmm. he had to leave. They were they were developing this, this whole character mm -hmm. for him, and he went and did Fargo last year. And now the next episode that we're going to be shooting on The Rookie, mm -hmm. they've brought his character back. That's great. And so he's going to be back on The Rookie for uh, with a big role this time. He loves you. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm thrilled. I'm yeah. thrilled that he's going to be doing that. You know. uh, and the lead uh, female in my uh, film also ended up 
on the rookie had nothing to do with me. Mm -hmm. uh, her agent put her up for it. They loved her. She got cast. So, you know, things like that happen. See, we uh, are, as directors, we, we can cast movies. We know what we're doing. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's funny, yeah, too. It, it, People don't realize that, you know, they're making a movie and they say, ah, I just, I can't, I don't even know how to approach a big name actor. It's surprising the the caliber of actor and the, and you know, sort of that high B-list or low A-list or that nobody thinks they can get. But if you're giving an actor a part that they've never done before, a role that's kind of outside right. their comfort zone, they'll do it just because they want to do it. They want to stretch. Actors want to act. That's something I learned very early on. Yeah, and that's exactly what Nick told me. He said, nobody would ever cast me in this role. Right. And he said, I really want to do this. I said, absolutely. Yeah. That's a, the, when I first started working with Wolfgang Bodice, and we just talked about him earlier from A Few Good Men, um, he'd never done a Western before. And he always wanted to. Every little kid wants to do Western. And I said, you're, you're playing. And he goes, really? This is, you put me. And I go, dude, there were a lot of black cowboys. It, lots of, there was thousands of black cowboys right. in the Wild West. And this part is based on a real character. And I want you to play it. And he was so thrilled that he, he said yes so fast just because he could ride a horse and shoot guns. And he was, he was quite, a, quite happy about it. So, uh, yeah, you can go after guys that have big resumes if you just offer them something that interests them that piques their interest um right before we get too far away let's talk about your film we mentioned earlier um you went the one that you entered into the idlewild festival in 2023 a film called promises um mm -hmm. it was a cool film that i enjoyed a lot and you you like you said you won a few id awards uh including mm -hmm. best director and i did you win best short love that year I, yes yes yeah. yeah um then that's how you and i became acquainted um right leading to my getting out my knee pads and begging you to come on board as our <laughs> for our grand jury in 2024 did you enjoy the process of making the short film or, uh, and and where did the story come from i you told me but i think my listeners would, would really like to know where the story actually what how that germinated uh, well, the story is a just one moment in the life of a woman I met uh, 35 years ago, mm -hmm. and I've had I've wanted to tell her story for all these years. I, I had an outline for a biopic, uh, which got really close to be went into development, got really close to being produced for television, but it ended up nothing having to do with me, but it ended up not getting done. And I had just held on to it all these years. Mm -hmm. And when it came time to to come up with something to shoot, um, I had a completely different story, a more comedic thing with a larger cast. And then COVID hit, mm -hmm. so I couldn't do it. And I thought, okay, I, I still have to get something done. What can I do in, in a smaller way? And I realized that I had this, this story and so I took this one scene this one moment and um, uh, and wrote an outline for it and Nikia Cox my producer who's also an actress on the rookie um, loved it wanted to produce it and she introduced me to Deitra Hicks who helped to come up with the dialogue because I'm it, even though I'm a script supervisor and I deal with dialogue yeah. uh, I'm, not, I'm not necessarily great at writing it but um, I know when it's good and when it's not, and I know what to fix. So, so uh, Dietra took her stab at it, and then we worked together to perfect it, and, and that's how we did it. Uh, and then we did crowdfunding in order to get the money and, um, to do it. And I had a blast. And when I, when I mentioned before about family, mm -hmm. my nephew was very much involved. He has his own little production company. He helped provide... Uh, he and one of the guys from The Rookie ended up being, the, I had two line producers, um, each with uh, expertise in different areas. Mm -hmm. And um, and so, you know, equipment was brought in and, and stuff that, that would have been beyond me to try to, to get together. Um, and then my, my nephews came and carried stuff, you know, <laughs> had everybody involved. Um, and I loved it. I was so happy. I felt like I was finally home. Uh -huh. uh, and uh, we, we, did, we shot it in two days, and I had some difficulty because the rookie decided to shoot on the same Saturday mm -hmm. that we were scheduled to shoot. 
So I lost part of my crew um, to the rookie, and um, I didn't go, obviously, but um, I had to make do. I had sure. to just do it and right. get just get through it. Um, and uh, and we did. And I just I was so so happy. I was exhausted every at the end of each day, <laughs> but um, so so happy that I'd finally uh, came home. It, like I said, it just felt so good. Yeah. Um, I had uh, Liz Friedlander who wrote, did the um, directed the uh, pilot for the rookie, mm-hmm. um, and she's directed a few things, and she's you know producer, and she loved the film. And she said, you finally felt like you were in your body. And I said, that's uh, right. That's exactly right. That's a great quote. I like that. Yeah. You finally felt like you were in your body. That works. That's really good. Mm-hmm. Um, let's, uh, let's talk about, we've been talking about other directors. Uh, you mentioned Rob Reiner, of course. I can tell you enjoyed that process, learning so much, working hand in hand with you know, amazing directors. Who are some of the other people you've been, worked with that you've really enjoyed? Some of your favorite directors to work with? Well, I learned so much from Sidney Lumet. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, he worked in a very specific way. He would have two weeks of rehearsal, which is not something you normally get to, that, to right. have, especially in television. Right. But um, he had all the sets taped out on a, on a floor mm-hmm. in a church, and he would rehearse it like a play. So there was a day of table read, and then uh, another day of talking about the characters around a table. Mm-hmm. And then he would call, just like rehearsing a play, you call certain actors in to start re- blocking certain scenes. Mm-hmm. And it was me, the prop guy, and Sidney, along with the actors. And um, he would block the scenes, and I would time everything at the end of the, each day. Mm-hmm. He wanted to know the timings for, uh, for the film. And at the very last rehearsal, it would be the entire movie. Uh, even car scenes were just chairs wow. set up where the actors could sit. Right. And he would run it just like a play, and his DP would walk around with him, and he would say, okay, at this point, I'm going to go in for close-ups. At this point over here, I'm going to do over shoulders, Mm -hmm. and the DP would be writing it in his script, and I would be timing it. And the very last run, I would time the whole thing, and um, and that was what he expected it to be. Uh, And it was so fascinating how he worked, and then the the discussions with the actors about their motivation and about their characters and about, uh, I mean, Jane Fonda had a big thing to do with props. Mm -hmm. So in the whole opening of the picture, and so she's planning which prop she's going to do when and and what's the sequence and and what is she feeling when she's doing these things mm-hmm. so it was it was definitely film school and definitely you know acting school because he came from the Meisner school mm-hmm. of acting and and he had done you know theater for so long and live tv uh and so that was really amazing to work with him and we shot it in 37 days yeah, Which, that's quite... for a feature film, that's pretty short. <laughs> that's my norm. <laughs> <laughs> 25 to he 30 days. He shot Prince days, of the but... City in a, he, 57 days for yeah. Prince of the City with 120 locations. Yeah, it's it's amazing. Clint Eastwood is known for doing that as well. <laughs> he just moves so fast. And and I think, uh, it was it Cassavetes who said the minute that he directed something with more zeros behind it, he got frustrated because it just takes forever. <laughs> he says, I could have shot, right. shot half the movie in the time we've gotten three pages of dialogue in here. It's funny. But, but I was so impressed with the prep yeah. because because Sydney was so well prepped mm-hmm. um, about everything. Mm-hmm. And um, and so that's why it was so smooth. And, and the sets were half pre-lit because mm-hmm. he, the DP knew where everybody was supposed to be and what they were going to be doing mm-hmm. um, and what his job was going to be. So, so I kind of like this here. idea a lot. I'm just thinking about it for now. You know, I'm thinking, man, if I could mm-hmm. just squeeze in a week of doing that, mm-hmm. it, it w- everything would go so much faster, you know. Hmm. Mm-hmm. The, the, the yeah. wheels are turning. Now in my there you go. <laughs> and the prop guy knew everything that was supposed to be there when. Mm-hmm. And uh, so, you know, there were no, we never had to scrounge for anything. Mm-hmm. Everything was done. Wow. And Sidney told me right in the beginning when I first met him and he hired me, he said, I want you to know that I don't need any suggestions from the script supervisor. 
And I said, right. okay. And the reason being was for all these, because of all these rehearsals. Right, right. I ended up giving him one suggestion during the film. Mm. And that was a, a shot of Raul Julia is, is in the scene with Jane. Mm -hmm. And he answers the phone. And on the other end is supposed to be Jeff Bridges. And um, he hands the phone to Jane. Well, in the wider shot, when he picked up the phone and heard the Jeff's voice, or the character anyway, his face changed, mm -hmm. his expression changed, and then he handed the phone to Jane. Well, the phone was on a fake wall, and when Sydney wanted to go in for the coverage, he said, okay, that wall can come out. And I said, I said, Sydney, wait a minute. And I told him what happened. And so he ran it as a rehearsal to see what Raul did, mm -hmm. and he really liked the change, and so we kept the wall up. Oh, wow. And... Uh, and he gave me credit. He said, thank you, Faye, in front of everybody. But that was the only thing I did for the entire film. <laughs> um, interesting. Interesting to me that people don't realize that you're on a film set. You can learn so much, and then you, you're you actually able to interact and make changes to a movie, if you do it correctly. Some directors mm -hmm. aren't into it, but most directors, I think, are appreciative when, uh, with, as you said earlier, the extra eyes. You know, it's... Uh, mm -hmm. It's important. I mean, there's only one captain. There's only one general on the That's set. Right. But at the same time, a general who doesn't listen to his his uh, aide de camp and his uh, his lieutenants is. You know, it's uh, it's a fine... could lose the war. <laughs> yeah, that's right. It's a fine line when you're making films. So many things can go wrong. Um, I, go ahead. I wanted to mention just for fun, um, sound. Mm -hmm, yes. Um, Sound is really, really important for uh, short films. Mm -hmm. If the sound is bad, you're going to lose your audience. And uh, it doesn't have to be, you know, anything fancy unless you want to have certain sound effects, which I ended up putting in post. Mm -hmm. I put some sound effects in. But, um, but having good recorded sound uh, makes a huge difference. And um, as a script supervisor, I'm listening just like the director is listening. And if I hear a plane coming over and the director doesn't necessarily hear it or see that it's, that it's covering up a, a particular line, mm -hmm. I will say something so that we go back and do it again to, uh, uh, because of the sound. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's like, again, this comes back to team. I, I work with one production sound guy on everything, commercials and narrative and it's just because, again, that guy, he's just so good, but he also knows what I'm thinking before I'm thinking it. But, uh, yeah, it's all those little things, man. You can't, you can't run the war if you're, if, you know, because you can't see everything and you can't. I get so involved sometimes that planes going over, I don't hear them in the sound. My sound guy, Tom, mm -hmm. will say, a plane, hold for plane. And you're like, I didn't even hear it. I had no idea because mm -hmm. you're so focused. And a lot of times I work... I'm, you know, I'll have headphones, but they're never in my ear, on my ears. I'm always got them around my neck. And I learned that mm -hmm. it's, it's better to, uh, I don't know, you just got to, it's such a, it's such a uh, collaborative job, you know, making movies that if you've got people on board, you've got to, you've got to listen to them once in a while. Um, you re you recently finished directing. We talked earlier about the the ABC series, The Rookie, and you've done independent film now. And do you enjoy working within the Hollywood system, or you know, is it? I mean, obviously you enjoy directing, but is it is it more fun for you to do the Maverick indie sort of thing where you're kind of out there and your neck's on the line and and you don't have all that support? Um, is you know, as Orson it, Welles it, Orson Welles said, that's it's, a that's a hard that's a hard one for me to answer because mm -hmm. I grew up in the industry, sure, yeah. you know, and I grew up with, you know, my dad was nominated five times for Oscars. So mm -hmm. he was doing only the big movies with right. the full on, yeah. you know, uh, so, so it, I mean, stand by me was a little movie. Mm -hmm. We never expected it to do what it did. Right. And, uh, and it, it was set a $7 million budget mm -hmm. or an $8 million budget. Um, yeah, so that was a surprise that we were all just having fun. Right. Yeah. <laughs> um, but uh, you know, there's the advantage to doing the big thing is that you have the resources. Mm -hmm. You know, you have. You know, I can I can say to the DP, well, I, you know, 
uh, I want a dolly over here, you know, mm-hmm. and they can pull out the equipment and do it, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, on the other hand, the the independent thing as a director, it's all yours. Mm-hmm. So you get to choose what shots to put in the edit. Right. When I edited The Rookie, one of the things I asked, I asked a veteran director, a woman actually, Bethany Rooney, who's written books about oh, right. directing yeah. and who's an amazing television director, and I said to her, how much can I cut? And uh, it, just in case it was going to be too long. Right. And she said, don't, don't cut dialogue. Mm-hmm. Well, that was really important for me to know that mm-hmm. because I was not going to be able to, to cut out what my, my writer, what my showrunner uh, wrote. Mm-hmm. And if I had tried to do that, I would have been shooting myself in the foot. Right. Yeah. So, you know, for television, it's a whole different game. And um, there were shots that I that I did that didn't end up in the episode because either he didn't like the shot. I know there's one that he didn't like, Mm -hmm. but um, uh, uh, it didn't serve the show in the way (laughs) that ABC and so on are used to having it. You know what I mean? It served me. I really liked it. It was artistic, (laughs) but it didn't work for, um, for what they, you know, their audience. You know, it's it's who are you who are you playing this for? Yeah. So in that sense, uh, uh, television, you're limited. You have to go with whatever the style of the show is, and mm-hmm. so on. Uh, but like I said, you have the resources, mm-hmm. so you can you know change the camera, you can change the lighting without too much problem. You yeah. have the budget to mm-hmm. to do things. Um, however, on the other hand. There I was on my film, and I didn't have a crew, and oh my gosh, what was I going to do on Saturday morning yeah. <laughs> when everybody was going to show up? <laughs> and uh, and we just did it. We mm. just went out there, got, you know, I called my former nanny, uh, <laughs> and she brought two kids to have in the park because right. I didn't have kids. Right. Uh, you know, you just do what you need to do. Yeah, uh, adapt or die. And, it is it is funny. It's such a tightrope and a fine line between working television and even working thick. Like I, I did, I did uh, reality TV, which I absolutely hated. And I've done a lot of commercial work. Everything's so different, but you mm-hmm. just adapt, you know, and it's, but when you're out there on your own, I think it, I was ready to quote Orson Welles when he said that, you know, more zeros is the killer of creativity. <laughs> in other words, if you, <laughs> if you have too much, if they make it too easy for you and they give you the kind of budget where, you know, some directors will just, a uh, 30 day shoot schedule will turn into 60 real quick just because, mm-hmm. you know, they figure they've got the time and they've got the money. And uh, I think you have to go, even it's nice to have all the toys. In fact, it's imperative on a lot of shoots, but you've got to go into it with that maverick spirit and say like you just did i'm i'm just going to get it done and that means if i have to call a nanny with bring two kids over to play background in the park <laughs> you just you just do it and mm-hmm. uh, um yeah adapt or die that's uh, i always tell in fact i just told a filmmaker friend of mine really recently that even though it's not a movie about filmmaking the baseball movie moneyball with brad pitt it, mm-hmm. Watch that if you're a filmmaker. It just tells you how mm-hmm. thinking outside the box can lead to amazing things. You know, doing things mm-hmm. different and don't get don't get tied down to film school or film geek terminology or you know journeys that uh, lead you to nowhere. Um, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Being able to have the ability to just just do your thing and just even if it seems wrong to everyone around you just do it and it it leads to amazing things i'm sure you've found that out yeah Uh, well the end of my movie i didn't have a drone i always wanted to have a drone Uh and be in the middle of the intersection and and rise up from her and Mm -hmm. do this whole thing and i couldn't have a drone i didn't have the money for itc which is traffic control Mm -hmm. and the cops and all of that stuff Mm -hmm. So all of a sudden, we put up a ladder as far into the street as we we, we could sneak it, and put my DP up on the on the top of the ladder yeah. to have a high shot at the end of the movie. <laughs> you just do what you have to do, you know. Th- yeah. That was it, it was going to have to be that, yeah. which worked great, you know. Yeah. Um, sure, I would love to have had a drone and do it the other way, but but drones, uh, you know. 
drones are becoming a little cliche. And it's funny you say ladder because I needed an opening credit shot of just a car coming down a road, but I needed a high angle. And uh, my AD went to the local fire department and said, do you guys want to come out and how much is it to rent your (laughs) And they said, we'll do it. And so they just did it like a training exercise. They went to the location. They they took that ladder on that truck as high as it would go and our dp my dp tarina as i was talking about earlier she climbed up there (laughs) and got the shot that's brilliant (laughs) that is absolutely brilliant i wish i had a photograph of that that's Uh, just that's that's uh, really wonderful (laughs) i may i may have some photographs but when you meet tarina you'll she's uh it's funny because i had to fight for her on the first film we ever worked on which was a a big cast feature film and they wanted a certain DP, but I wanted her because I knew she knew the look I wanted. We shot on uh, we shot on film, and I wanted that again that mid seventies kind of vibe. And she knew exactly mm-hmm. what I wanted. But she they didn't want a woman, you know. And it wasn't it was yeah. It's always comes down to sexism. But they were just ah, that's a lot of we're going to do a lot of handheld stuff. And I go well, you're not going to get her some camera ops and no no we're gonna do this kind of raw it's like okay so she's a woman so you figure she can't so I took her to lunch with our executive producer and I the minute we sat down and I said so Tarina tell tell him about how you were in the army and you learned deep how to be a cinematographer by, from by shooting from helicopters at war scenes at battle <laughs> <laughs> he goes you were in the army and he was Mar- he was a retired marine and they were such close friends by the end of it and he acted like he had never doubted her at all. He was like, yep, she's, oh, she's our funny. gal. <laughs> that's and great. She just laughed and said, I, I go through this a lot, man. I Don't worry about it. I was all apologetic because I knew <laughs> I knew what she could do. And I knew it was just a matter of if this guy learned her background and knew, you know, he wouldn't even have to look at any footage. He just, and, and he did. And that's how it worked out. So, oh, that's great. Yeah. That's so, great. we're going to wrap it up for this episode of the Stephen Savage Show now. I told Faye I'd have her for 45 minutes. <laughs> we're almost, we're pushing an hour now. But, um, uh, first, before we leave, Faye, where, where can people find out more about your work? And aside from your IMDb, which is always a good place to, to look, but are you, you, you have uh, Instagram and all that stuff? I have, I, I have in- Instagram, uh, 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 Facebook, uh, Faye Brenner, Facebook. Instagram is, uh, uh, is Opera to Go, actually. Um, opera and, to uh, Go. Opera okay. to Go, yeah. Um, and I may have a, a Faye Brenner. I'm not even sure. I have somebody who does that for me. Yeah. Um, and um, yeah, and then uh, IMDb. Um, there's a, a. I have a PR gal, and you can contact her, and she'll get a hold of me. Oh, that's great. Yeah, and just F by FYI, um, for the filmmakers that'll be attending the Idlewild. Cinema Fest this year, you will have the opportunity to meet and speak with Faye because she's going to be showing up. And she's, as you can tell from this interview, a very warm person. And, uh, and I guess what I'm trying to say is she doesn't bite. So <laughs> <laughs> I'm happy to answer any questions. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. Okay, well, that's our show for this time around. I want to just remind everyone you can hear this podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Amazon, and uh, it, just about anywhere else you listen to your favorite uh, podcasts. And don't forget, the Idlewild International Festival of Cinema celebrates its 15th year this March 5th through the 10th in beautiful Idlewild, California. 100 film and video projects from 16 countries. And you can find out more about that as well as see the schedule of films and get your tickets and passes at IdlewildCinemaFest.com. So, for myself, our executive producer, Trinity Houston, the entire Savage Podcasting Network team, and, of course, my guest, Faye Brenner, uh, thanks for joining us. And we will see you next time. Thanks so much, Faye. Thank you. Thank you.